Good evening, everyone. Please direct your attention to the screen. We'll never own up to our past. We'll never build sustainable cities. We'll never set foot on another planet. We'll never stop the overdose crisis. We'll never find a cure for Alzheimer's. We'll never treat each other as equals. We'll never clean up our oceans. But together? Together. We have the potential. We have the potential to shape a different future. A different future. A different future. Welcome to UBC Connects. For today's event, we'll be using a web-based platform called Slido. It lets you ask questions in real time. It works on any mobile device, so take out yours and follow along. We'll show you how to get started. Although we do want you to use your device, please make sure it's on silent as we don't want to interrupt the program. Now, once you've confirmed that your device is on silent, pull up your browser and go to slido.com. Now enter the event code UBC Connects. You'll see the hashtag symbol is already populated. All you need to do is enter UBC Connects, all one word. Now you're all set to submit your questions by clicking on the Ask button. Other people can like your question by giving it a thumbs up. When we get to the question and answer part of the program, our moderator will ask the top rated questions first. You can start submitting questions, but they won't be visible until the moderator appears. At that point, you can start voting. Before you go, we have one more thing to ask. We'd like you to take out that mobile device one last time and go to the polling tab. That's where you'll see a few questions about your event experience. Please do take a moment. Your feedback matters to us. Enjoy the program. Please welcome to the stage Director Pro Tem of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, Maura Quayle. Good evening. My name is Maura Quayle, and I'm proud to be the director pro tem of the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs here at UBC. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. We're so thrilled to have you join us tonight in the room as well as online for this unique partnership between UBC Connects and the Phil Lind Initiative. In a few minutes, Professor Ono will tell you more about the Connect series. First and foremost, I, want, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered together on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Tonight, we will hear a presentation from Governor John Kasich, co-presented by the Phil Lind Initiative, a dialogue series created in 2015 from a major do donation to UBC by alumnus Phil Lind. Phil Lind is one of Canada's most respected media industry leaders, whose strategic advice and generous support have been vital to many UBC endeavors. Hosted by the School of Public Policy and Global Affairs, the initiative invites prominent public scholars to UBC to engage students, faculty, alumni, and community, aiming to provoke a national conversation around issues that not only affect American society, but Canada and the world. Phil, where are you? There you are. Thank you so much. <laughs> Following Governor Kasich's presentation, Richard Johnston, professor of UBC uh, Department of Political Science, will moderate a short conversation with Governor Kasich and then open a Q&A with you, the audience. Professor Johnston is the Canada Research Chair in Public Opinion, Elections, and Representation. His interest and his expertise in electoral systems, party systems, and parties spans his entire career and involves close investigation of patterns in Canada and the U.S. Tonight's program is being live streamed for those who could not be with us this evening. 
The audio podcast, as well as some video clips, will be posted on the event website at www.ubc.ca slash ubcconnects and the Lind Initiative at uh, .ubc.ca in the days following the event so you can revisit and share with friends and family. As you just saw, for the Q&A, we'll be using an online audience engagement platform called Slido to include everyone in the conversation. Even those of you at home can participate. As a reminder, you're able to submit questions now for those of you who really came prepared and throughout Governor Kasich's presentation. But we're gonna hold off on posting the questions you submit for all to see until our moderator takes the stage. At this time, you'll be able to begin voting on all the submitted questions. And if you would like to tweet during the program, please use at UBC and hashtag UBC Connects and hashtag Lind19. So let's get started. Uh, it's always a pleasure to introduce Professor Ono uh, and to tell you a bit about him before I invite him to the stage to say a few words and introduce our honored guest. Professor Ono earned his BA in Biological Science at the University of Chicago and his PhD in Experimental Medicine at McGill University. His principal research interests focus on the immune system and on eye disease. Early in his career, Professor Ono held a variety of teaching, research, and administrative positions at the John Hopkins School of Medicine, Harvard Medical School, University College London, Emory University, and finally at the University of Cincinnati, where he served as president starting in 2012. In 2015, Inside Higher Education named Professor Ono as America's most notable university president. And he is now the 15th president and vice chancellor of the University of British Columbia and the host of this new public lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Professor Ono to the stage. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Maura. I'm excited to be here with you all today at the Chan Center and welcome you to this joint event between the UBC Connect series and the Phil Lind Initiative. The Lind Initiative has been incredibly important in bringing esteemed speakers to the University of British Columbia. I'd like to also welcome all those that are watching uh, via live stream. I think that today will really be a very interesting conversation. UBC Connects is a public lecture series that features the world's most esteemed thought leaders and focuses on pressing global issues. I'd like to recognize and thank our colleagues at Alumni UBC for their support of this series and the Phil Lind Initiative, our partner for this event. I'm extremely excited that our guest tonight is Governor John Kasich, whom I've had the privilege of knowing for several years. Governor Kasich is a politician, a New York Times best-selling author several times over, and a television host on CNN. He has had a storied career in both the public and private sectors. He was elected to the U.S. House at just the age of 30 after serving as the youngest state senator in the history of the state of Ohio. He went on to become the chairman of the House Budget Committee and served in Congress for 18 years. He was elected governor of Ohio in 2010 and re-elected in 2014. As governor, Governor Kasich closed an $8 billion budget shortfall without a tax increase. He reduced taxes by $5 billion and outpaced the nation's job growth with 557,000 new jobs in Buckeye State. Under his tenure, the Ohio budget reserves grew from just 89 cents to $2.7 billion. John was a leading voice in promoting bipartisan solutions to almost everything, healthcare, reform, immigration, and international trade. After stepping down as governor last month, 
John made his debut as a senior political commentator for CNN. As I've said, he's a New York Times bestseller several times over, four times to be exact. The titles that you might have read include Courage is Contagious, Stand for Something, The Battle for America's Soul, Every Other Monday, and most recently, Two Paths, America Divided or United. As president of the University of Cincinnati, the second largest public university in the great state of Ohio, I had the privilege of working closely with Governor Kasich on many occasions during his governorship. He was and is a passionate advocate for higher education in Ohio, and he even achieved a difficult feat of bringing together the presidents of two rivals, Ohio State University, sometimes called the Ohio State University, and the University of Cincinnati. And because of his encouragement that we work together, we accomplished a lot of things, including a statewide clinical trials network, as well as a budget that all presidents worked on, something which is really rare among U.S. governors. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce to you Governor John Kasich. Please give him a warm round of applause. I just wanted to, uh, before I head off, just give him a little bit of swag. And so uh, I know you think about the Buckeyes a lot, but this is uh, the land of the Thunderbirds. So here you go, John. There we go. Welcome. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, I'll tell you something. You are so lucky to have him as your president. You know, he was at the University of Cincinnati, and we worked very closely together. And to just give you an example, you know, universities always want to grab all the money they can. So Dr. Ono and Dr. Gordon Gee, who's now the president of West Virginia University, uh, they, they came to me and said, why don't we just do something together? If we're going to have money for reconstruction or building, why don't we force the universities to work together? And those that need it should get it, and those that don't need it shouldn't be selfish. And we accomplished it. We also had a proposal and a program that got put into law. I think it may be the only one in the country where universities do not be reimbursed unless students actually complete courses and graduate. That provides the incentive for helping students to actually achieve their goals and to make sure that there's responsibility not just on the part of the students, but also on the part of the university. You're so lucky to have this guy. We're so mad that he got out of the state of Ohio, and I tried to take him back tonight, and he said, I'm not going back. So give him a great round of applause, if you would. So I, I'm kind of on this clock, but I don't know how this is going to work, because I kind of have a dual purpose here tonight. But I think the first thing I should do is tell you a little bit about myself. He gave you, you know, books and you know, career and all that. But let me tell you a little story about who I am. I grew up. Uh, in a little town just out of Pittsburgh called McKee's Rocks. My father carried mail on his back. His father was a coal miner. My mother's mother lived with us for a while. She could barely speak English. So I come from a blue collar, heavy Democrat community. They used to put roadblocks up to keep Republicans from getting into this town. <laughs> and um, so you got the picture, hard scrabble, hard working, if the wind blew the wrong way, people would find themselves out of work, but it was, it was a fantastic place. I made a, this big journey, 180 miles to the west, uh, to that little school called Ohio State University. And uh, there you go, right there. And I found myself, do you know about Ohio State, sir? I'm a graduate. All right, well, I found myself in a dormitory that was 23 floors high, filled with all 18-year-old college freshmen, men in one tower, women in the other. They used to refer to these towers as Sodom and Gomorrah. <laughs> and, uh, but the interesting thing is, I found myself in a dormitory, you don't know this, doctor, with 15 college roommates. There were 16 of us crowded in that dorm. Did you live in one of those towers, sir? Hall. OK, well, that was, it. that was the spoiled hall, OK? I was in the rough and tumble. <laughs> So I'm there for a few minutes, right? And I get upset about stuff that's happening. And my Uncle Emil always told me, Johnny, if you ever want to change something, start at the top. So I called the president of the university's office. And 
they were not letting me in very quickly, and I just kept calling, because that's what you do. You bother people till they relent. And I finally got a meeting with the president of the university. So I went in to see him. I had on my best blue jeans and blue jean jacket and put my hair up under my hat, went in to see Dr. Fawcett. And he was very impressive. He was a very tall guy, sonorous kind of a, of a, of a way in which he spoke. He was incredible. And uh, you know, I was a little bit impressed, because I had only been in school for a short time. And I looked at him, and he said, what's on your mind? And I lodged my complaint. And I said, sir, before I leave, um, I love the, the rugs. The carpeting is beautiful, the lighting, the tables, the chairs. Wow. I said, I've been, under, I've been in school for about a month, and I'm undecided. So I'm sort of thinking, maybe this is the job for me. What exactly do you do? <laughs> and so he tells me about his academic responsibilities and his fundraising responsibilities. And he says, tomorrow, I'm going to fly down and have a meeting with President Nixon. He and I have been friendly for a number of years. And I said, well, sir, there's a number of things I would like to talk to him also about also. <laughs> Could I go with you? And he said, no. And I said, well, if I write a letter, would you give it to the President of the United States? Now, I saw some students earlier, and I hope there's a number of students in here. And so first of all, if you don't ask, they can't say no. So he looked at me, he said, I guess I could deliver a letter. So I went back to my dorm room, and I wrote a letter to the president telling him how I thought he was doing. And I signed it, sincerely, John Kasich, PS. If you would like to discuss this further, <laughs> let me know. I'll come see you. I'm a college student, right? <laughs> so a couple weeks later, I go down to my mailbox, and there's a letter from the White House, the office of the president. I open it up, and I go upstairs, call home to Pittsburgh, my mother, who at that point I don't think was in the workforce because my brother and sister were still there. Uh, I said, Mom, I'm going to need an airline ticket. The President of the United States would like to have a meeting with me in the Oval Office. <laughs> and my mother is shouting, honey, pick up the phone. There's something wrong with Johnny, OK? <laughs> this is a true story. So my dad's carrying the mail, and his father's a coal miner, as I said. And my mother, her, this is like, what is, what is this kid doing, right? So. They had a little discussion, and they decided they would buy me a ticket. So I got an airline ticket. I flew down to Washington, showed up at the gate, said, hi, I'm John Kasich here for a meeting with the president. And uh, I'm 18 years old, right? I'm, I'm not even through my first quarter at Ohio State. Guy says, well, come on in. So I walk inside the White House, and I'm right outside the Oval Office. And a guy walks up to me, and he says, listen, young man, you're going to get five minutes alone with the president of the United States. What do you think? Yeah, what do you think? Huh? It's Nixon, Wait, what would you think? What would you think? Any president, what would you think? Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'm thinking. I've got a new jacket, a new shirt, a new tie, and new pants. I'm not coming out in five lousy minutes. I didn't come all this way for five minutes. So they opened up the door, and I walked into the, uh, into the Oval Office. It's Mr. President John Kasich, John Kasich, the President of the United States. I spent 20 minutes alone with the President of the United States as this 18-year-old freshman. That's the good news. The bad news is I spent 18 years in Congress. If you add up all the time I spent in the Oval Office, I peaked out at the age of 18 and should have moved, <laughs> and should have moved to Vancouver. <clears throat> so let me go and let me tell you just a couple more stories, because this is what's possible in life, because that's what we have to think about. What's possible in life? So, um, a few years after that, I um, find myself hired in the state legislature. I didn't know anybody. Never thought I'd get a job there. One fluke after another, the next thing you know, I'm working there. And I'm working for a guy who was very, very close to Ronald Reagan. And Reagan, in 1976, is running against Jerry Ford in the primary. And my boss, who was this state senator, called me up and he said, I'm out at the convention. I can't handle all this work I have. Get on an airplane, fly out, or you have to help me. So I flew out to Kansas City, and they had a trailer where all the people running, the, all the smart people, you know, the campaign manager, the communications director, the regional directors. And I walk in the door, and there are all these, these big shots in this little trailer, including my boss. And they look at me, and they say, young man, somebody was supposed to be here to handle five states, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, and I don't remember the last one. And you know, he's not here. Do you think you could handle five states for Governor Reagan? 
I had absolutely no clue what that meant, and I said, absolutely, no problem. <laughs> and my job was to try to get delegates to vote for Ronald Reagan over Jerry Ford. So in order to do that, I would ride in the car with Governor Reagan. We'd sit in the back seat. We'd go to these delegations. I would stand up and introduce the guy. Then we would get back in the car and go back to the headquarters, and he didn't win that. But I was on the top floor of this hotel with these senior guys and Governor Reagan, and he said, we may have lost the battle, but we have not lost the war. I was like Forrest Gump. I'm standing in the back of this room watching grown men cry. <laughs> and you know what? You never know when lightning's going to strike. Be prepared. Now, for the Democrats that are here, I want to tell you one other story, and this is about keeping an open mind. Uh, regardless of what we think about other people, don't be getting in a silo, and don't be hating on them, and don't be thinking, and don't be diminishing them. Every human being is created in the image of the Lord, I believe. And so I'm down in Washington, and I'm working in this summer job. I'm working at the National Institutes of Health. I had no idea what I was doing there, uh, doing a little bit of research and things like that. And every weekend, I would hitchhike to the beach. And one day, I'm hitchhiking with one of my pals, and a guy comes by in a big uh, Cadillac. And he picks us up, and he's driving us to the beach. I get talking to him. He said, you know, I used to work for JFK. I have one of the original TP, uh, PT boats, one of the pins. They don't exist. He said, and it's prized possession. And I was very, very close to Lyndon Johnson. And I said, sir, could we get back to Washington? Could I take you to lunch? He said, sure. So I took his name and his number. It's called networking, students, networking. <laughs> and I go, we go to lunch, and we go to this restaurant. And I look at the menu. I said, sir, we cannot eat here. I don't have enough money to pay for this lunch. I thought we were going to McDonald's. And he laughed. Well, because I was with him, and he was a Democrat, I had an opportunity to meet all of the Democratic leaders. It was such an awesome and great experience to be engaged with a whole other political party. And when I ran for the legislature, by the way, I ran as a Republican. And the guy that hired me called me up. He said, how's the campaign going? I said, pretty well. He said, well, I assume you're running as a Democrat. I said, no, I'm running as a Republican. He said, send my campaign contribution back to me, would you? <laughs> Another you know, amazing thing of seizing on a moment. So I've had an incredible life, the ability to be independent, to do what I think I need to do, uh, to listen, to lead as best as I could. But I want to tell you, in our country today, in America, you all know that the country is very divided. People are really all uptight. There was a time not long ago, a year ago, people couldn't even have weddings. They couldn't have Thanksgiving dinners. People would show up and scream and yell at one another. And it's still very much people wringing their hands. I assume some of that goes on even in Canada. But in our country, it's been that way. After having been in public life for 30 years, I have to tell you, Stop wringing your hands. Big time leaders don't really matter that much in our daily lives. Now, that's going to shock some of you. Do presidents matter? Yeah, they matter. They can set the mood, and there are times when, when they can make a decision that can really affect us. For example, if you're an immigrant and you, you know, you're going to be shipped out of the country, yeah, there, there are very good examples of where this happens. But the real question for us is does power and change come from the top down, or does power and change come from the bottom up? And I maintain it comes from the bottom up. And what's so good about that is that means that we are empowered. We, not somebody that lives you know, over in Ottawa, or somebody that lives in Washington, or all these senators, these peacocks, and all this. No, the power rests with us. And that gives us an opportunity to do some very significant things. And I want to say to all of you tonight, these are just my observations, my life observations. Do you understand? Do you understand, young lady? Do you understand, sir? There has never, ever been anybody like you before in all the history of the world. Do you know that? And there will never be anybody like you again. You're unique and special. I was in Utah at a beautiful place. I mean, it had the kind of beauty that we have right here in Vancouver. 
And I was telling a crowd this, and there were people behind me, and I turned around and said this to this young lady, and she started to cry. I got home, I told my wife, why do you think she cried? My wife said, because you probably scared her. But when you think about this, think about this for a second. Do you understand that you're part of a mosaic? That you have a destiny and a purpose? Sometimes we forget this. We think I'm just one of the crowd. Yeah, you may be one of a crowd or part of a mosaic, but there's nobody that can take your place. That is a reason to be so exciting, excited about what we do in our lives. And what is our purpose and what is our destiny? Now, I don't know about you, but at Ohio State, and I'm sure down at the University of Cincinnati, there are always, late, and throughout our lives, there are always those late night discussions where we ask ourselves and we ask those who we love and who we trust, what's the meaning of life? They've, they've discussed this and debated this for centuries, since the beginning of time. Plato, he debated it. He believed in the eternal nature of the soul, whether it was Aristotle, whether it was Camus, whether it was Rousseau, whether it was John Locke, whether it was St. Augustine, whether it was Thomas Aquinas, they all debated it. And they all agreed on one thing. Life on this planet doesn't go on forever. Life is short. You know, it, it, we tend not to think about that. And in regard to the fact that life is short, what are we going to do about this? Now, in America, we're in foot, we, you know, we play a lot of football, and we've got four quarters in a football game. Sometimes if you watch a football game, not much happens for three quarters and about a half. And then in the last little bit of the game, everything happens, and people say, why didn't they play like that before? Or in the NHL game, when you're behind by a goal, you may have been playing conservative, but in the end, everybody's right. They even pull the goaltender to try to score. Why is that? Because there's a sense of the end and a sense that we have to make things happy, happen. We just can't sit back and be swallowed up by time that sort of diminishes our purpose. So I want you to think about, in regard to that, in regard to that hockey game or that football game, what are you going to do if you recognize the fact that life does not go on forever on this earth? Are you going to live a bigger life? Are you going to try to live a more meaningful life? Because you don't want to save it for the very end. You see, because you have the power and you were made special to accomplish certain things. So we have to commit ourselves to living a life bigger than ourselves and to take advantage of the personal power we have to do good. Now, I'll bet there are many in here saying, Okay, I agree, I, I, you know, yeah, Kasich says to me, you have to live a big life, and I say to you, you got to change the world, and you're like, I'm going to change the world? Me, a little old me, I'm going to change the world? I, how could I change the world? Well, I want to tell you about a couple people that I've met. I met a guy years ago, he's developmentally disabled, his name was Albert Lexi. He watched a television show for Children's Hospital on a television station in Pittsburgh, fell in love with a woman that was running the the, the foundation, went down to the hospital the next day and asked if he could shine shoes. You see, Albert dropped out of school, and he took up shoe shining as a very young man. Well, he went down there, and they said, I guess, sure, you could come. So Albert would strap on this box, and it was a huge box with all the shoe polish and the brushes and all this stuff, and he would get on the bus, and he was terrified of the bus. And he would go to that children's hospital a couple times a week. And he would shine shoes for the doctors, the nurses. And if you went in the hospital, you would find a whole bunch of shoes everywhere. And what were they? These were doctors and nurses who wanted Albert to touch their lives. So Albert would shine shoes for, you know, a few bucks for the shoe shine. And he'd put the tip money in his other pocket. And over the course of his lifetime, shining these shoes one pair at a time, he donated over $200,000 to the children, to the foundation at that children's hospital for mothers and fathers that couldn't pay their bills. Did Albert change the world? You better darn believe he changed the world. There's a lady in Columbus who I heard about on a happenstance. Uh, her son was going to college, doctor. He, he was going to Franciscan University over in, over in Steubenville area. 
One night, he was in his apartment with his roommate, and a gang broke in and kidnapped him. And they put him in the car, and they drove him into the woods of Pittsburgh, and they executed him. They blew his head off. I ran into the nephew, and he told me this story, and he said when this had happened, he and his brother had gone to visit the, 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 the security people where these guy, guys were being held, and the guys that, that executed him were 16, 17 years old, and all he wanted was a minute in there alone with him. Rachel Muha saw the hatred that had risen in her family, and she remembered, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And she said, I knew at that moment that I had a battle hate in my own family. This woman has now created operations. She, has, she had no money. She's just a lady, just a regular lady. When you meet her, she's just as humble and as nice as you could imagine. And she's now opened up a number of operations to take the very kids who would be subjected to gang violence and has them in these facilities. And the people who leave the facilities come back and work there. They're part of the staff. And for some reason, people who had money decided to give her more money, and she's bought a series of houses where people were paying sky-high rent. Now she allows them over time to purchase and actually own these houses. This woman completely changed the world. And she's rocking and rolling. Just, I hope she's watching tonight. And then I used to give these medals out to people when I was governor called Courage Awards. You know, I'd pick a group every year that did something special. And one of the ones that gave me the greatest amount of joy was a nine-year-old boy. He had lived in homeless shelters when he was just a little, little kid, real little kid. His grandmother, who he was li living with, told him, I'm going to buy you an Xbox for Christmas. The little boy says, Grandma, I don't want an Xbox. Take the money you were going to use to buy the Xbox and buy blankets for people who live in the homeless shelter. Does that little boy change the world? He absolutely did. And there are so many other stories. How about, how about what happened in Las Vegas? People go out to Las Vegas to a country concert. They're having the time of their lives. They're listening to music and they're dancing. And then all of a sudden, out of the hotel, they thought maybe that was firecrackers. Wish it had been. There were gunshots. And as people stood down there, the music, of course, ended, and the, and the chaos ensued. And people were gunned down. And there were people who were at that concert who threw their bodies in front of other people that they didn't even know to save their lives. I don't know what I would have done. But I met one of the EMT workers, gave her a medal too. And she put her own life on the line in order to try to save somebody. Change the world? You got to, you, unbelievable. And one, just one famous person, Michael Phelps. You remember him, the Olympian? He won all those medals, a great swimmer. Do you know what he's doing now? He does a commercial where he sits in a chair in the bottom of a swimming pool. And he says that most of my life, I spent my time looking at the bottom of the pool instead of looking up outside the pool to see the faces around me. And the whole effort that he's now engaged in is to bring out the element of mental illness in our society. And by the way, yesterday, we were driving in a section of Vancouver. You see these homeless. You know, I think about it. There's a little baby. My daughters, when they were born, my sweet twin daughters, I could hold them in, one of them in my hand, the other one in the other hand. Think about moms who hold their little babies in their arms. And one day, those babies grow up and they're living on the street. I mean, it's, it's a really hard thing, isn't it? And I was thinking about who is it that has the gift to be able to get the, gain the trust of them so that these human beings, that this flesh and blood is not being, being, not being utilized on these streets. You see, I think we all have these certain talents where we can help to change the world. And what we have to think about 
is what are we willing to do? Now, any of these people, Albert or Rachel or the, the, well, the little boy, not so much, but Michael Phelps, uh, the, the lady, the EMT, you know, you know, the fact is what they had, what many of these people have who do these miraculous things, they're resilient and they have a dream. Think about what your dream is. And resilience, it means you never give up. You know what else you need? You need a little bit of love. We're all connected. We're all in the same rowboat. You hear about these people that are on these rafts in the Mediterranean, and we wonder, these kids, are they going to drown? We're all on the raft. We're all in the caravan, aren't we? Trying to escape drug lords or drug cartels. We are all in the caravan because we're all connected to one another, whether we want to know it or not. So it takes dreams. It takes resilience. It takes effort. And sometimes it even means, by the way, that we have to take, we have to walk a lonely road. It's not always easy. You know what's amazed me? You talk about change. Talk about change from the bottom up. You all know about Parkland? You know about the shooting in that school? Those kids have been standing up and fighting for change in gun violence, and they've been attacked. It's OK. When you do something meaningful, if it's something that your friends and the people that care about you tell you is OK, you know, then you, you soldier on, just like those kids are doing. And they're changing the state of Florida. They're making it safer for people in that state because they've been resilient and not afraid to walk a lonely road. Because when you try to lead and do something different, people, sometimes they'll attack you. It's amazing. Martin Luther King, think about him. He was resilient. He fought through the, the dogs and the gassings and the beatings. It was unbelievable what he did. How about Nelson Mandela? What is it, 28 years in a, in a cell? And he comes out, he has no bitterness, he has love. He changes South Africa. It was just remarkable what he did. So it takes some resilience. But finally, I want you to understand, and I hope I can convince you, if you're waiting for politicians, forget it. Oh, no, every once in a while, you will see a leader. William Wilberforce was one of those leaders in Great Britain. There are leaders that live in Canada, leaders that we've honored who live in America. You know, I just saw the stage play Hamilton. We know that there are, are significant leaders. But I can tell you, they don't win without us. You see, because power comes from the bottom up, not the top down. And let's talk about a couple of the things that I'm so familiar with that I'll tell you about, and that's civil rights. Civil rights didn't happen because the political leaders wanted to do something. They didn't want to do anything. They wanted to run and hide. Martin Luther King went into the White House and saw John Kennedy, and he walked out disappointed. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, they're the ones that, that drove the change. They're the ones that drove it from the bottom up and forced the politicians, and forced the politicians to do what they needed to do. Women's suffrage. You think there were a bunch of guys sitting around saying, let's give women rights. <laughs> it was the women's suffrage movement. Women that said, we will not put up with this. We will not tolerate this. Unfortunately, there weren't enough women of color who were included. They're being included today, thank God. Or I remember Vietnam. You think Vietnam ended because the generals one day said we were done with it? There was an eruption on the college campuses, and it was the bottom up. It was the power that changed things. And I've already mentioned Parkland, and I cannot begin to tell you how hard it is to come up with rational gun control. You know, in America, you have a little different view here, I think, than what we have. We're Second Amendment people, but you can change the Second Amendment. For example, a red flag law that if you know somebody in the workplace or in your family that poses a threat to themselves or others, you go to a court and you take their gun away for a period of time until they're stabilized. We can't pass most of that in the states. You know why? Because people aren't marching. But the Parkland students changed it in Florida. The politicians would never have thought about it. And because of what they demanded, they drove change, and America is going to change in this area. Climate, environmental awareness. 
Do you know why politicians will finally get off the dime in my country? Because they'll have no choice. The growing power of women, their investing, the growing power of millennials will force them to look at the evidence. And remember, there's nothing that's more dramatic than a conversion. There was a Jewish rabbi by the name of Saul. He became Paul. You've heard about that. The, 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 the changes that can occur on the road to Damascus. So we don't want to write anybody off, but we've got to give them the evidence. Look, my wife and I made 10 trips to Glacier Park and the Peace Park up in Waterton. You all know where that is? I mean, it, it's beauty rivals what you have right here. And by the way, this place is unbelievable. <laughs> OK, this place is unbelievable. I remember coming across this bridge. I'd have to ask Sarge, the guy that took me from the airport into Vancouver. And we went across the bridge and these glass buildings. I mean, I don't know if I was looking at diamonds. What, 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 this was amazing to me. I made them drive me across the bridge yesterday so I could drive back across the bridge and look at these buildings. The lighting, what human beings have done in Vancouver is astounding. You know, everybody talks about Vancouver. You never hear anybody say, oh, I, I went to Vancouver, I, I didn't care for it, okay? Everybody's excited. I was excited to come here, but I'm blown away. And I'm not sucking up. I'm telling you the truth, okay? I am blown away. It's all great. But it, is, it can't even begin to rival the creation that the Lord has given us. The oceans, the mountains, is that snow or powdered sugar up on the top of those, huh? I mean, it's breathtaking. When we would go to, over to, to Glacier Park, my wife and I would talk every year about the disappearing glaciers. OK, so some people say, well, who cares? Well, how about the fact that since the Industrial Revolution, from the beginning of the time we measured these issues, from the beginning of when we measured them until the Industrial Revolution, from the Industrial Revolution today, the amount of carbon in the atmosphere has increased by 40%. The, the decade between 1990, or I'm sorry, 2000 and 2010, it was the warmest decade in 1,300 years. And listen, the government is giving us reports saying this is problem. And the, and the Defense Department in America is preparing for climate change, global warming, and the implications of it all. So there are very little, very little questions anymore. And the students were asking me, what about deniers? I said, well, I'm too old to waste my time on deniers. I've got to get those people who are more listening to all this. And I'll tell you where the country's going. They're beginning to understand this is a real issue. Let me tell you just a little bit about Ohio. We had a 30% reduction in the last 10 years of the amount of carbon in our atmosphere. Pretty darn good. Secondly, you know why it's happened? Because we were in a position to help develop natural gas. No, we were fracking in, in Ohio. I created it. And that was controversial. You know, fracking, you know, what's going to happen? Well, we've managed it. And we've managed it as well as anybody in the country. And we have captured the methane gas. And we have told the producers, you will do this. And our rules and our laws are tougher than the federal EPA. We also had renewable standards. Now, when I came in, I was told we had these renewable standards. They were mandates. The legislature said, well, I think we should make them goals. You know, we're conservatives, and mandates aren't good. I said, oh, you want to get rid of mandates, huh? Make my day. So they sent me a bill to repeal the mandate and turn it into, into, uh, into goals. I vetoed it. And they overrode me on a number of issues. But they never overrode me on this. And I hope and pray they don't get about it today, because we're in the right direction. And our, OK, you have this beautiful ocean. We've got an ocean in Ohio, too. It's called Lake Erie. <laughs> and it's a jewel, isn't it, doctor? It's a gem. 
And what we know is because of climate change, we believe that the rainfall intensity has, has, great, has significantly increased. And we know that what's happened as a result of that is the rainfall comes and washes the fertilizer or the manure right off of the field into the lake, and we've got al al alga blooms. We made a significant improvement, but not enough. Because those who were, who were involved in this runoff, they said, oh, not now, and not, not today, and you know, maybe not tomorrow, and you're not giving us enough money. And well, you know what's happening now? The city of Toledo is declaring the lake a human being, a person. Just like they declared corporations a person, and they got a ballot initiative, and I don't live in Toledo, but I'm thinking of moving there so I can at least vote on that. And I tried to tell somebody in the industry, you see what you get when you don't practice and think in the, where the puck is going to be? We had a program that could have resolved this, but you didn't want to do it. But I'm proud of what's happened in Ohio, and it's increased my, my awareness. Now look, we got the Green New Deal. I had four students ask me about it. I mean, in one, one session. The Washington Post and even the New York Times has said, I, I don't want to misquote them, so if I get you a little wrong, write an editorial. Um, <laughs> basically, nice idea, not going anywhere. Off the point. But I'd say the positive thing about it is it's raised an issue. And here's what I believe as a public figure, former politician. Um, if you don't have ideas, what do you got? My mother and father told me something when I was a student at Ohio State. I remember it, and I hate it to this day. I'd go home and criticize something. They'd say, well, Johnny, if you don't like it, what are you for? I hated that question. If you're going to oppose something like the Green New Deal, what is your answer? What is it that you're going to do to deal with this issue of climate? Unless you're a denier. If you're a denier, OK, we'll just leave you behind, and you'll catch up maybe someday. But we need to move forward. And there's a series of things that we can do that are constructive, that are market-oriented, and I think can make a significant difference. And we can start with the issue of either a carbon tax or cap and trade. Cap and trade worked with SO2, the sulfur, acid rain. And we know here in the West, between California and the Western provinces, there is now a program to basically do a cap and trade. And it's working. It's making a difference. And it's market-based. Now, you can set it up however you want to set it up as to whether you want to plow some of the revenue that's produced from cap and trade or a carbon tax back into some research on efficiency or whatever. Or maybe you return it all to people. Uh, that's a matter of debate and discussion. But the fact is that a market-based carbon tax, a market-based cap and trade program can make a significant difference. And it's time for Congress to stop dawdling and to have a proposal that we can enact in America that will begin to provide a positive impact on our environment. What do you think? OK? Now, I got some others. I mentioned natural gas. Now, I know that a lot of the environs, they hate natural gas. No, don't hate it, because you can't get there overnight. Ultimately, what natural gas should do is to serve as a bridge to the renewables. And you know what we really need? We really need battery technology and more research and development, doctor, into battery technology, because once we can have the life of battery being extended, we can have distributed energy, that then the, the amount of energy produced from solar and wind can be stored and used whenever it is needed. And beyond that, if we could get better battery technology, it would make me happy, because in my brand new Tesla, I can only go 239 miles without charging, and I'd like to go about 500, OK? <laughs> so Elon, if you're listening, we need more battery. And he's trying to do it. But more research in the battery power, more research in the renewables, Look, the federal government can't do everything. They has to be able to have priorities and stand up to special interests that hug on to programs, whether they work or not. But there are certain things that the government, our federal government, ought to be investing in. And one of them is energy and renewables and battery technology. And the other one is in the National Institutes of Health. 
begin to deal with the issues that surround the brain or the issues of pancreatic cancer or, or childhood cancers, yes, spend money. Not a measly few pennies, but a lot of money on the research. It can make a giant difference in the lives of our people. So more research. Cafe standards. You know, they want to relax cafe standards in the... Are the are, what are you kidding me? Even the big companies, the car companies, believe in the cafe standards. And they didn't want to release that? What is that, like going back to a goal instead of a mandate? Baloney. The cafe standards ought to be extended, and they should be enforced. And that will also make a difference in terms of how the world, how the world turns. A couple others quickly. Um, you know, electric vehicles. I'd keep the subsidy for the electric vehicles. And uh, we can think about small nukes, too. But one other issue that is really important is you must have a competitive environment in your community so that the ability of these renewables and for natural gas investors to actually make a play. If you, are, if you do not have a balanced and a level playing field, you can snuff out the ability of entrepreneurs to be able to bring something to the fore and be able to solve problems. By the way, cap and trade or a carbon tax, you know what that'll leave to? More research, more efficiencies, more breakthroughs when it comes to energy. Now, China and India, terrible. We can do all these things and more, but there's, they're just belching out, they're building these coal plants every single day. It's terrible. So the answer for the United States and for our friends here in Canada, she don't leave the table. Use the power to influence. The United States has no business withdrawing from the Paris Accord. I don't even know what, what that's just, that's out of the line. The United States needs to be at the table. We need to lead. And we need to change what is going on in China and India, even if at times we have to share the technology to get them to stop doing this. And you know what it's all about? You know what's so amazing about this whole movement? There's, a, I think, a young girl, I don't know, she's, she, I think she's 15 years old, her name is Greta. And every Friday she <laughs> takes off school so she can argue the case because she wants to have a planet where she can live and she can have kids and they can live. And to honor Mother Nature and what the beauty that we have in this world. This is all being driven now, not even by Parkland students who can be 18, 19, 17 years old. This is being driven by 13 and 14 year olds, one of whom got in an argument with Senator Feinstein of California that went viral where she had to apologize. Don't ignore the young people. And you know, because of that, because of what I've seen both with Parkland students and what I've seen from the, these young teenagers on the environment, and when I see the rise of the power of millennials, when I begin to see that they have a view that everything is just not about profit, that if you make profit and you have no values connected to the profit, it's bankrupt. And so I'm optimistic about the future. I'm optimistic about the people that can drive change. But the bottom line on this is please realize that you can make a difference in your neighborhood, in your community. Sometimes it's a letter, but sometimes it's what you do individually to get on top of this issue of climate, of global warming. We, we have to do it. And together, we can do it. And we can change the world, just like all those people I mentioned. So I've gone on too long, but I couldn't help it. This was on my chest. I had to get it off. So thank you for listening, and God bless you. Thank you. Think of me as the band at the Oscars. What's that? You're the... Think of me as the band at the Oscars. The so you're in the near chair. Well, the, the band, the first thing I saw, I just wanted to see Bohemian. I just wanted to see... Uh, Queen do that opening number at the Oscars, and I stayed on the plane coming, getting over here, but I got to see them, and they were really good, weren't they? I loved it. Yes, doctor. <laughs> so thank you so much for this. So my name is Richard Johnston. I'm a professor at UBC Political Science. Uh, we have some time for questions up here, and then we're going to go to the Slido stuff in the audience. Uh, so we're going to start seeing those questions and start seeing the voting, but first of all, us. So, uh, 
I want to actually kind of call you a little bit on the link between bottom up and top down. You know, so um, it's really struck when you were talking about Martin Luther King right. and the grassroots, very, of course, very carefully constructed grassroots. But at the end of the day, it came down to Congress. Yeah. When we think of the names that are critical there, Everett Dirksen comes up. The Republican was the key at that point in American history. Now, you know, you basically um, quoted on Axios, basically prefacing, prefacing today's talk, that it's Republicans should stop denying humans' impact on climate change. What's the deal? Why are you having to say this? How is it that the party of Everett Dirksen, a conservative party, but nonetheless, yeah. a party able to reach across yeah. the aisle, you know, it was the Nixon administration that founded the, the EPA. Well, Teddy Roosevelt was our Absolutely. One of great so how did we get here? Okay, well, first and how of all, deal with it? yeah, Everett Dirksen didn't show up one day and say, I want to provide these civil rights. What happened was the churches connected. Martin Luther King came from the churches and they marched and they marched and they marched until they got more and more people and finally the public said, we're not putting up with this anymore. Everybody should be treated equal. That's how that happened. That's how Wilberforce eliminated the slave trade in Great Britain. Uh, now, he was a politician, but he emerged from the movement, the anti-slave trade mm -hmm. movement. What I'm arguing to you is if you're going to, and, and so let's just take somebody who's way out there, who is, who's, a, I don't mean way out there crazy, I mean somebody who's really a leader, they need help. I, I'll give you a perfect example. I wanted to do that red flag law on guns in my state. If I could have put 10,000 people on the lawns of the state house, I would have passed it. I couldn't get them to show up. So these things have a way of bubbling up. That doesn't mean that we don't need leaders in the Congress. Doesn't mean that at all. It's, and look, I mean, what I think some people are worried about, and we have to respect people that we don't agree with, even when they're, they're unless they're hate mongers, you know, we, gotta, we have to listen to them. But I think what some, some of the politicians are worried about is what about jobs? What about the disruption? What do we do? And that's why I talked about this program here, because I think everything is reasonable there. I think it is, a, it is a program that can be embraced. And by the way, there are a number of Republican leaders, George Shultz, Jim Baker, all of whom are saying this is important. But to be honest with you, our Republican Party is, has, has been moving to, to be more of a naysayer and no new ideas. But then I watched the Democratic Party move har farther and farther to the left, and it's like, what is going on? So they'll get their act together, but it's going to be up to us to demand it. So cap and trade or carbon tax, um, very controversial here as well. Now here's the set of ideas, especially the carbon tax, which is a conservative notion, right? To actually internalize the stuff inside the market. Yeah. And um, it actually took the, in, the community of environmentalists quite a while to come on side with the notion that a market solution actually works. Right. More or less as they were doing so, the marketeers are going offside. So how do you sell this? And we got maybe a problem on both sides of the aisle here, but how do you how do you actually sell a carbon tax or a cap and trade? Be particularly given yeah. that they are they have tax implications. Well, but it depends how you structure it, right? Mm -hmm. It depends what you do with cap and trade. If you want to use these kinds of things to just grow government, you're not going to get there. But if you want to structure it in such a way that some of the money gets returned to the public and some of the money gets put into efficiency research, whatever it is, uh, or uh, you know, just the ability to, uh, to be smarter about the way we build our buildings and build our homes and things like that, you, you have to, it has to be with both parties. Now look, I was the chairman of the budget committee when I was there, and I, was, I spent 10 years of my life fighting to get to a balanced budget. And we did. I was the, one of the chief architects, and I worked with the Clinton administration. You know what it's like to balance a federal budget? It, we paid down the largest amount of the publicly held debt in modern history. It hadn't been done since man walked on the moon, and it may not be done again till man walks on Mars. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you, you have to keep at it. You have to find your allies. It has to be bipartisan. And it has to be people that say, I want to do something. Here is what I think is happening. I think there's enough people stirred up inside of, of the United States to where you can no longer say, I don't believe it. I don't believe in the science. I think that is a shrinking number. And I am optimistic if we can get a bipartisan group together to begin to move something. It's going to take time, but we can get there. 
I mean, well, look what happened under Bush with sulfur, with acid rain. Mm -hmm. You know, that happened. Look what's happened with California. And states may have to take this on. You know, may, maybe I missed an opportunity to do something in my state by, you know, getting together with Michigan. But when you're in Ohio, it's pretty hard to get together with Michigan. Um, but I think that there are ways to get this done. So on, if so I on, didn't think that, I would tell you that it wouldn't. It can yeah. happen. To what extent have Americans forgotten that the U.S. used to be a leader on climate change? If you looked inside the debates in this country 20 years ago, we were the aspirational, not the regulatory. We didn't have caps. We had targets. Now the shoe seems to be on the other foot. So can you say more about how the agencies can be repurposed or revitalized, NOAA and the EPA and so on? Because they, they, they're being targeted. They are being prevented from getting their message out, right? The, the Weather Channel doesn't want the Weather Service to have any access to the public and that sort of thing. What about all that sort of thing? Is that, is that part of the program? Of, well, I, I th that's, a, that's really a leadership issue yeah. out of the administration. Now, you know, I stood here and talked for a very long time. And, you know, I don't think I ever mentioned uh, T-R-U-M-P. Okay, I didn't even mention it. Because it's not just that, but the administration is somehow, look, you got 13 government agencies saying that this is a problem, and yet the executive says, I don't want to pay any attention to that. Okay, I just think that's just dead wrong. Look, my problem with the president is that, you know, he, he's, he's engaged too much in dividing people and not in, in, in uh, uniting people. And if, if we could get to a point, look, I don't know that it's going to happen here with him. I mean, I'm, I'm, I was holding out hope, but when I look at, at thir of his own government telling him it's a problem, and then he doesn't, you know, he just ignores it, what can I tell you? I didn't vote for him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I didn't, not only did I not, in, let me just tell you this, you know, we had the Republican convention in my state. I never went in the convention hall. Do you know what that was like? Okay, so wait a minute, hold on. I, I didn't go in the hall. I didn't endorse him, and I voted for John McCain. How do you think that's gone down in the Republican Party, huh? But you know what? I'm not in there to. I'm not in there to try to. Yeah, it sounds like a political talk. I'm done. I'm going to sound like a politician if I go any farther. I'm just telling you, I don't understand it. I don't know what to tell you. Well. <laughs> I can't tell him that. I, I just don't know what to tell you. I tell you this, as people get more and more revved up about this issue, you gotta remember uh, something that a guy told me when I first went to Congress. I was 30 years old, right? I mean, my parents were like, Johnny, what are you doing now? Uh, it was hard for them. When you go to your district, it's you and the voter, not you and somebody in Washington that tells you something. And that's why it's changing now. More and more of the, of the American people believe that climate change has actually affected them. People are getting fed up with this. This is a ex perfect example of what I'm talking about with bottom up. And they're going to, at some point, they will tell the president no. He's not going to get his national emergency. They just voted in the House to deny it, and they're going to take it to the Senate. You mark my words, they'll, they'll pass it in the Senate. He'll veto it. But I'm telling you, they're, they're, it's beginning to boil up. Enough of this already. Well, let's actually take a specific case. You mentioned uh, Greta Thunberg in Sweden, but there's also Alexandria Villasenor in New York, inspired by Greta Thunberg. Yeah. So she is a classic example of the kind of bottom-up politics you're talking about. How would you counsel her to go from standing outside the UN and actually getting in the doorway of Congress or where or Well, you remember there, was, there were those young people that confronted Feinstein. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah. you go to a town hall. You know, when I was 16, 17, I never even told this story. I was 16, 17 year olds. I, we had a, a riot in our high school, and I showed up and, and uh, kind of gave a lecture to the school board. You know, I love the fact that these kids are speaking up. What I would tell a young person like that is be respectful. You can say what you think, be strong in what you say, but be respectful. Don't be disrespectful. Frankly, folks, in the world today, we need to be respectful of one another. We can't live in our own silo, and because somebody says something we don't like, we just, we just bash them. I mean, it's got to stop. And by the way, we need to even be sensitive about what we post in social media. Okay, it's, it, it, you all know what I'm talking about. It's, we got to be careful, uh, and we got to be responsible, and we got to realize that we are our, our, 
our brother's and, and sister's keeper. Well, let's take a hypothetical Republican politician who might be considering how to reach across the aisle, bridge these gaps. Um, so you have posted online with the devil incarnate, Hillary Rodden Clinton. Yeah, I did. You we have, wrote a thing on the elephant. You have, did you know that? I do. <laughs> you have, uh, have co-signed uh, a statement on Medicare and Medicaid with John Hickenlooper of yeah. Colorado. Uh, so these are concrete gestures. Do you worry that you would actually delegitimate yourself with your own party by doing this, by reaching across the aisle, by daring to hang out with Democrats? No, I think it's great what I'm trying to do. I, th I think okay. the crowd agrees with that. <laughs> no, let me let me give you an, let me give you an example. I want to give you an example. I, I have not talked about this, and I'm, I hope I'm going to be able to do this. But I had a great friend that I worked in Congress with by the name of Ron Dellums. He has now passed away. Ron was way on the left. Okay, and they called. Pretty called good pitcher too, I'm told, in his younger days. No. No. I don't. He but, thought he was a good oh, yeah, pitcher. Well, I know that. Story. He was just a class act. He was so articulate and so smart, and he and I worked together to limit the production of the B-2 bomber. And um, he just died, and his wife called and said, do you think you could come and speak? And one of my friends said, John, you, you should try to do that if for no other reason than to say you see Republicans and Democrats can get along. And, and she was, his wife was saying to me, can you talk about the fact that you disagreed on so much, but yet you found something to agree upon. And what I said was, wait a minute. We don't need to talk about what we disagree upon. Why don't we go find something we agree upon and forget the rest of it? That's how you get things done, right? You look for a way, you look for those things that you can connect with somebody else about. I love John Hickenlooper. He may be, he's running for president. Some people said it should be a Hickenlooper Kasich ticket or a Kasich, hey, I prefer Kasich Hickenlooper ticket. Uh, but I said you can't fit that on a bumper sticker. It's too, too long, so that isn't going to happen. But no, and, and with Hillary, Hillary and I were talking about the, the destruction of the elephant. And uh, I'm told that we may get a chance to go to Washington and, and uh, testify in the Congress. I'd be delighted to do it. I, you can't demonize people that you don't agree with. And I like working with people, and that's how you get things done. That's how we got the budget balance. That's how we got welfare reform. It's, that's part of what life is. Okay, I think this... And this is legitimate. I mean, this is not some political... I mean, I'm, I'm not running... I, you can't even vote for me, okay? <laughs> so... Should we, should we take a few of theirs? I think it's probably about time. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> we're on the clock here. So... I'm seeing in front of me, I'm also seeing them here, but it's actually easier down there, uh, questions that have been sliding to the top of Slido. So let's just go straight to that. First one, you want to deal with the first one? Will the, Trump face the a Republican first one, yes. primary Will Trump challenger? Trump face a Republican in, primary challenger in, in 2020? Well, I think Bill Weld's saying he's running, so um, we'll have to see if others get in. Now, this is someone. <laughs> this listen, is, this is someone whom the listen, Republicans I, denied an ambassadorship to. Yeah, as I um, you know, I, I just don't know. As for me, you know, people speculate, and I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to make an announcement here tonight. But I, I don't know really what I'm going to do because, look, I had a, I had a wonderful time uh, running for president. It was great, and I, I learned some really important things. And I'll tell you what one of them was slow down. Now, people have been telling me about some of the beautiful drives that are here in this part of the world. If you drive about 80 miles an hour, you'll miss it. But if you drive slowly, it's amazing what you can see. We need to slow down a little bit and connect with one another. And I mean, I don't know if I can, uh, I don't know if, so I'm, look, we're all hypocrites, okay? We all are, and I'll be the number one hypocrite. I don't always do it right. But I was, we, we had a, a person today that was serving us at lunch and said, how's your day going? I said, do you really want to know? She said, absolutely. The fact of the matter is when we slow down, we learn things about other people. I learned that in the presidential campaign. Uh, I also learned that in politics, you can have an argument about issues, but what you really have to show people is that you get them, that you care about them, that you don't always going to agree with me and I'm not going to agree with you, but you know what? I want you to know that I care. 
That is the, such a critical part. So as to what I'm going to do politically, I really don't know. I'm enjoying what I'm doing now, and I'm th thrilled to be here tonight. I really am. This is a, something I'll never forget. Okay, so the next question actually reflects the fact that you're here uh, and that the problems that you've mentioned are, well, arguably American problems, health care, No, it's a Canadian problem, so too. See, because I think in health care, we pay for quantity and not quality. You know, we, do you ever go to the, see the doctor and say, hey, how much do you make? How much does this procedure cost? We don't do that. We need transparency, and we need to understand the quality that each of these providers can give us. And we need to have our companies, our corporations, begin to demand of healthcare providers that they provide high quality for their people at lower prices. Because what we're seeing worldwide is rationing, right? And so it requires a total tilt away from the way we currently do things. I'll give you one example. How about if we were to pay primary care doctors more money to keep us healthy? How about if we were to pay primary care doctors incentives if they were able to send us to the specialists who can get us well quicker at lower prices? We're, we experimented with some of that in Ohio and enacted some of it, but that's the ultimate answer on health care is to make sure we have transparency and that we change the way in which we think about health care to where we reward people for keeping us healthy or healthier rather than practicing quantity, quality. That is the issue there. In terms of gun control, we're not going to do away with the Second Amendment, but I mentioned the red flag law, I met, and I give the Trump administration credit for banning these, uh, uh, these places, these, uh, these uh, devices that can change a single the bump stocks. shot, the bump stocks. I give them credit for doing that. I mean, we have to have complete background checks. Those are the things that we have to do. And um, it happened, let me tell you, it happened in Florida. That is a, that is a very conservative state. They didn't even expand Medicaid. And yet those Parkland students forced it through. And I think in my state, ultimately, they will revisit these issues. And, um, you know, and I think we'll make some progress on that. Okay, the next one's a provocative one. Do you think Justice Kavanaugh should have been confirmed to the Supreme yeah, Court? It, you know what, I, first of all, when I watched the, um, the doctor testify, I watched her testimony. I was in the gym, and she made me cry. I'm, you know, the father of twin daughters and with a great wife. The problem is I never saw the documents. You know, I, didn't, I never saw the documents. And I think the documents should have been made public until I can have all the information. I just really can't tell you. He's now on the court. And the one thing we're, that I'm worried about on the court is that the court not become some predictable political decider. And you notice that Judge Roberts, who I don't know, but I want to call, he has served as a way to keep great legitimacy in that court. So it is not predictable and everything swings one way or another. That would be a challenge. And I give him a lot of credit for trying to maintain balance. He is the swing vote now. Um, so another question about Medicare. Why is the idea of Medicare for all so difficult to accept when, well, particularly for American politicians, when every other developed or many developing countries have something yeah, like universal but, compulsory. Yeah, Medicare. right. Well, you know, look, what we had with Obamacare, and there are elements of it that need to be dramatically improved. We have Medicaid also in our state. Now, Medicare, you're going to add all these people in there. How are you going to pay for it? We're already $21 trillion in the hole. I mean, whenever politicians try to sell me, like, my Christmas gifts, uh, I say, well, how are we going to pay for those? I mean, they sound great. But the other thing about Medicare is Medicare is beginning to adopt some of what I told you, what I mentioned to you earlier about value-based care, trying to pay for innovation. We believe in America, I believe in America, that it is the private sector that brings the innovation to health care. I don't believe government provides much innovation, and I know a, a lot about, and I don't know a lot about it, but I know some things about the Canadian health care system, and uh, it's exp very expensive. Uh, People, it, I know there's good things about it, and I know it it's also has its, its shortcomings. So first of all, I don't know how you'd pay for it. Secondly, I don't think that the, the answer to this lies in Medicare. I think it lies in a value-based system primar primarily driven by the private sector. And as long as we can make the market work, because the market has gone the other way, we pay for quantity rather than quality. So uh, I wouldn't want to be for that. Um, would you be for 
the health care mandate, an enforceable mandate, where the health care yeah, provision could tell, be through the yeah, private sector, to, but to tell, you have to have look, here's German a, style, here's, for example. Here's what happens with Obamacare. What it's done is it expanded Medicaid, which I agreed to do. And although I think I would like to have a little bit more flexibility on Medicaid, but there needs to be a safety net so that we can't disrupt the whole system and people lose everything. On the other side is a place where the subsidies are provided on the exchange. And I think by and large, that's a good approach. I wish there was less, I wish there was less restrictive language, but you still have to have some safety nets there. But if you could provide more flexibility, the cost would come down, more people would have it. And if you have a mandate, you know, we have a mandate on a lot of things. How are you going to enforce it? So you've got to be practical about these things. I think the answer ultimately is what I talked about, pay for, pay for quality, and at the same time, make sure that people with pre-existing conditions can get health care and, um, and make sure that those subsidies are there. And that's, look, I fought with Hickenlooper and Brian Sandoval, the governor of Nevada, to stop them from just carte blanche repealing Obamacare, we had better ideas about how to run it. That's where I think we should have gone. We'll see. Healthcare is going to be a big, big issue, including the cost of drugs. Do you want to say anything about the cost of drugs? Well, I think what happens is in America, we pay for a lot of the research, and then the drugs are sold outside of America at very low prices because they've already recovered their costs through the, the price in the United States. I think there needs to be some uh, rebalancing of that. And secondly, when it comes to a government, I think the government ought to have some leverage. In terms of in our country, we have a law that says I have to take all of these things. Well, there ought to be a way for me to be able to decide exactly what things I need and what I don't need, which gives me more leverage to negotiate to get lower prices. Okay, so now back to raw politics. Uh, this question is about congressional voting patterns. Uh, they note that the gaps are at an all-time high. It is now the case by the standard measures that the most liberal Republican is substantially more conservative than the most conservative Democrat in the House of Representatives. How can this gap be closed? Well, can it be here's closed? what happens. So just everybody can understand this. If you're a Republican today, you've got to watch your right flank. If you're in a district that's been gerrymandered where you basically have a lot of Republicans, if you step out of line, if you attack Trump or other, you could get a challenge from the right. So you're always guarding against that. If you're a Democrat, you're, now there's increasing stories about how the Democrats are being threatened if they don't move farther to the left. So you have the Republican Party moving to the right and the Democrat Party moving to the left. How do you fix that? Well, we've taken a pretty good whack at it in Ohio. And uh, I work with Arnold Schwarzenegger on this. And, uh, and here's what you do. You have what's called redistricting reform. You end what's called gerrymandering. Have you all heard of that term? And that's where you've got to have both parties vote on the districts so the districts become more balanced. If they're more balanced, then you're not going to be controlled by those on the right or those on the left, and you'll have more freedom to navigate. Now, look, at the end of it all, uh, at the end of all of it, it's really about your own leadership. So what if you get elected and all you're doing is trying to you know, get votes, but you don't stand for anything? So part of it is the issue of why you're there, but the other part of it is there are absolutely some things that we can do uh, to be in a position of where we can have more balanced voter makeups where people have to take into account both sides and not cater to one side or the other. Does that make the, do you all get that? And that requires, Jerry, that, that requires redistricting changes and an end to gerrymandering. The question is, what did I tell Nixon was when I was 18 years old? Uh, I don't remember. Um, <laughs> But what I can tell you is an interesting story. Um, in 1987, my mother and father were killed by a drunk driver. And it was the greatest nightmare that I could have imagined because as a young boy, I'd feared that my parents one night wouldn't come home because my father would pick my mother up whenever she did go to work late at night. And then one day, they didn't come home, and I got the phone call. And um, but let me let me tell you let me tell you something. Um, you know, in our lives, there's so many things that come at us that are so difficult. Um, what I learned from that was, first of all, and I'm not here to say that if you're a humanist, I don't respect you because I do. But I really spent. 30 years of my life examining whether I thought there 
there is a God, whether he cares about me. And um, I've concluded there is, and he does. And my parents' death did not ruin me. I somehow, through the grace of God, saw the light and improved my life. And in 1987, Richard Nixon found out that I had entered Congress. And he asked if he could have a meeting with me, and I went to see him where we talked about the importance of foreign policy. That's what he told me at that meeting. And he said, is there anything I can do for you? And when everybody asks you that, make sure you always have an answer. And I said, there is. I said, my mother and father were just killed by a drunk driver, and my sister's really having a hard time. And the reaction that he gave me, and this was well after he was removed from office, of course, was amazing to me. And he wrote a handwritten two-page letter to my sister that really helped her in the healing process. Um, just remarkable and amazing situation. So for those that go through struggles, it's tough. For those that watch people go through struggles, run in. Just tell them you care about them because it made a difference in my life. Well, you started with biography and we're out of time. You've ended with biography. So join me in thanking Governor Casey for his Thank you. Not quite, but not, no, I, have a, I have a few more things to say. Thank you all. Thank you. So I, I want to thank each of you for joining us in person and via the live stream for sending, spending your evening with us. Before we go, those of you who have your mo mobile devices active, take them out one last time. The planning team for UBC Connects and the Phil Lind Initiative would appreciate your feedback. Know that you're all expert users. You can log back into Slido, click on the polling tab. You remember that from the video before. Click on the polling tab where you will find a few questions about your experience at the event this evening. Please take the time to share your feedback. And again, thank you so much for joining this event. Please travel safely. Have a great evening.